working on plus one equations. Today, we are going to be playing a game that helps us practice plus one equations, and we're going to be working with our shoulder partners. Let's go over a couple of rules for working with our shoulder partners. Number one, be helpful. If your partner needs help with an equation, help them out. Number two, if you are playing, take turns. And number three, remember to be fair when you're playing a game. Okay, let's go over the directions. You are going to get a game sheet that looks like this, and you are going to get a die. Your job is to roll the die and take a look at the number and count it. Mine says three. So tell me the plus one equation. Start with three. Three plus one equals four. So then I would take my crayon, John, and I would color in four squares. One, two, let me move that out of the way, three, four. I can color any four squares, and remember that even halves these squares count as a full square. I'm going to put the timer on today and time you for 10 minutes playing your plus one game with your shoulder partner. At the end of the 10 minutes, we're going to check how many you have and write your score, and then we'll meet at the carpet and go over our results. Okay, and what do you get? What was your equation? So two plus one is? Okay, so that's good. All right, whose turn is it? Okay, let's see what you got. You get three plus one is? Go ahead. a graphic organizer. Remember, a graphic or organizer helps us remember what we've read. It helps us understand the story better. So what can a graphic organizer do, everybody? Help you remember the details of a story. Help you remember the details of a story. Let's look at our narrative story map for Lesson 49. You are going to skim and scan Lesson 49 to fill out the title, the characters, the setting, and then I want you to make a prediction as to what you think will happen in Lesson 49. Now remember, boys and girls, when we skim and scan, are we reading every single word? No. no. We are just trying to get an idea of what's going to happen in the story. What are the three things you look at when we skim and scan? Give me one, Zion. We look at the pictures to give us clues. James, we skim which part of the text? The title. The title can give us clues. There's one more thing we can look at when we skim and we scan. Amelia? The beginning, middle, and end. What are we going to skim when we look at the beginning, middle, and end? The first and Noah? The first and last paragraph of the story is good. What else can we look at? Pictures. We said the pictures, the first and last of each paragraph. The first and last what, everybody? Paragraph. The first and last of each paragraph. We're going to skim and scan the first and last sentence of each paragraph. Nice. So let's start with the title. Who can share the title with us? Elizabeth? Deals. Deals. And Lesson 49. Lesson 49. And anything capitalized in a title there, Elizabeth? The D in deals should be capitalized because it is a title. So double check yours. If not, fix it up. Boys and girls, we've been learning about the parts of an insect. Let's sing our song. Here
ready? Action. Head thorax abdomen abdomen. Head thorax abdomen abdomen. And eyes and mouth and internal too. Six legs and that's an insect too. We're gonna work on a point of view paper today where you're going to get to pick what your opinion is and then get it down on paper and share it with the rest of us. Okay? Our topic for today is going to be whether or not cursive writing should be taught in school. I'm going to quickly read through this article with you, which will give points on both sides of yes, it should, no, it shouldn't. And then you're going to decide what you believe to be true and write that down on paper with some supporting details to go with it, okay? All right, follow along with me on the board while I read Cursive Writing in School. So this article gave some really good points about why cursive should still be taught in school, and it gave some really good points as to why cursive doesn't need to be taught in school. You need to decide what you believe. Then you're going to write your opinion or your point of view on your paper with supporting details to support. Then you're going to share it with the rest of us in a few minutes, okay? Go ahead and get started. Okay, boys and girls, some of you are starting to finish up your point of view papers, so I'd like to hear what some of your thoughts are about cursive writing in school. Is there anybody who's ready to share what they've written? Brayden. In my opinion, I think we should not do cursive writing in school because I just think we should type everything. Hey, all of you have your paper finished and you have your opinion or your point of view about whether or not cursive should be taught in school. So we're going to take it a little further now. You're going to reread your paper and decide which one of your supporting details is your strongest one. And we're going to do a visible thinking strategy called a tug of war. You're going to write down your strongest supporting detail that supports your point of view on a sticky note. And then you're going to walk it up to the whiteboard and decide to show that you agree that we should have cursive in school or you think that it doesn't need to be there anymore. Okay? Everybody has a sticky note, so go ahead and write that down now. Okay, those of you in group one, when you are done writing on your sticky note, go ahead and put it up on the board to show what your point of view is. Called the visible thinking strategy because you can look up at the board very quickly and see what most of our points of views are. Correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. It looks like the majority of us believe that yes, cursive writing should still be taught in school. But there's a good number of you who believe that it doesn't need to be any longer. Nice job. snake and a snake you would eat a mouse? Yeah. Would a snake eat a big old bird? Yeah. No. <laughs> Not really, right? No. It can eat big birds. What else would it start to look more tangled? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, take a star. Oh, take a star. Alright, yeah. Olivia, you're gonna get Angel's gonna chew you up now. <laughs> what might a jaguar eat? A lizard? Okay. What else might a jaguar eat? You can leave it where it is, I think. Okay, I'm going to pass it off to Zaid. Zaid, you're going to keep going with the jaguar, you're going to pick a different animal. Okay, but before. This is a shrimp. This is a little shrimp. Yeah. Okay. And then the fish, and then this is the bear. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I laugh at my drawings. <laughs> All right. So he's right. This is a food chain. Food chains usually have what to signal who eats the next thing. What's a chain. 
What symbol like are you Like a um, recycling thing. What shape? What symbol is that? An arrow. An arrow. Usually we show like an arrow, right? This eats this, this eats this. So that's the food chain. And the difference between a food chain and a food web, on the front side of the paper, there's, you're going to make a food chain. So you're going to find three, three things or three or four things that would be in a food chain. And you're going to connect them and draw, cut them out and draw them on your paper. And on the back side, you're going to make a food web. So a food web involves a whole bunch of animals, a whole bunch of, bunch of chains. Um, Nate, what are we learning today? What's our objective? So tell us the difference between a food chain and a food web. And what's the difference between a food chain and a food web? Well, a food web has is the is an interconnected feeding relationship within the ecosystem, and a food chain is a group of plants and animals that all have. A relationship with each other through what they eat. Nate, can you explain a fault or a fault line? I think a fault line is basically plates interacting with each other. Okay, so plate like off your dish. No. And just plate. Like it's spelled like that? Is that the same kind of plate? No, where are these plates? Where are they at, Olivia? In the ground. They're, they're, we're, we're on them right now, right? And if, um, let me give them a clue. No, you just tell me the answer. Uh, magma? Magma. So inside the earth there's magma. When magma comes out of the earth, what's it called? Um, an earthquake? When it comes out of a volcano, what's that? Oh, lava. Lava, um, yep. Yeah. So Zay, we looked at this map this morning and there's 12 plates. So in a few minutes, I'm going to give you this piece of paper and you're going to cut it in 12 pieces. So this piece of styrofoam. Mm -hmm. yes. I put that on. Because we're going to make the model of an earthquake. Can we do a little bit? One, two, three, four, five, six, more. Six more. Yeah. Hey. Okay. All right, so kind of squish them together. We'll pretend like they're touching each other. And then we're going to have an earthquake. What's an earthquake? An earthquake is really that shape. That shape. What was the fancier word we used for shape today? Vibrate. 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 So you're not going to vibrate. Someone just doesn't grab the earth and start shaking it, right? Mm -hmm. So you're grabbing the earth and shaking it right now. <laughs> right, so we're going to vibrate our desk. So vibrate your desk and see what happens to your plates. You want to see what happens to the, to the earth as it floats on the magma. Keep vibrating it. Keep vibrating it. Oh. It's scary. It's going together. Okay, stop. It went what, together. What's happening to your pieces? They're going floating together. apart. Oh, some floated apart. Some floated together. Some floated together. See those ones? Oh, look at, look at um, this one. It's, the one piece is on top of the other piece. So we had we had a third type. What's the third type of earthquake? There was floating apart or separating. Floating apart. Or being together. And then what were the other ones called? Slip. Slip. Okay, so we're gonna make you have another earthquake and see if you can find some that see if you can see the three types. Alright, so Olivia didn't get a chance to do it, so we're gonna let Olivia vibrate the desk. You guys can go for it and vibrate it. This will be so hard. See if you can see the different times of the Now we're going to show the perspective from the person doing an actual McCrell walkthrough on a teacher doing a lesson. When I go into the classroom, I'm going to be looking for several things. I'm going to be looking to see if the objective is posted somewhere that the students can readily see it and keep referring to it. I'll also be looking to see if the teacher refers to the objective as well. Um, I'll be looking for our nine strategies and seeing if the students are engaged. And then at the very end, I will interview a student quickly to see if they can tell me what they've been working on. We don't always want to have this out in the open while a teacher is teaching. Sometimes it 
throws them off track. So I will actually come fill out my form once I get back out to the hallway. So this would be from my perspective on a McCrell walkthrough. Opposing side from your original thought. Go ahead and do that now. Olivia, as you're sticking yours on the board, share. You guys did a very nice job on this activity. We can look up here and see, just by looking at those sticky notes, how some of our ideas have shifted, how some of us have been persuaded. How some of our points of views have been changed. Tonight when you go home and you're sitting at the dinner table with your moms and dads, ask them. Because I'll bet all of them were in first Friday in school. And then can you tell me See what they think about it now. Now that there are so many devices available to everybody to you. Phones, tablets, computers, laptops, the opposing view, iPod. See what they think. See if they think that person should still be taught in school. Or if they don't really see it. So then when I come out into the hallway, I like to step away from the windows so the teacher, once again, isn't distracted and the students aren't looking to see what's happening. And that's when I'll pull up my walkthrough form. So I go to my McCrell app and I choose a new walkthrough. And I choose Blooms, Steenland Elementary, which is our school. And then it's really easy to find the teachers. They're listed by last name. So I choose Mrs. Stacy Ellis, who, by the way, was our Teacher of the Year this year. And it automatically brings up such a user-friendly chart. So it already says what the date was, already says the time for me, the teacher. So then I can go ahead and do the actual walkthrough. So the grade... I select the value. Now these are actually second and third graders, so I would choose mixed. Content, they were working on the language arts. Segment of class, it seemed to be the ending of the class, which is really nice to be able to see because a lot of times we're right there for the beginning and sometimes it's really nice to see how a lesson ramps up. So I will choose the ending. The next is creating the environment, and you can possibly choose all three. I believe because it was the end of the class, Mrs. Ellis was providing feedback as well as giving effort and recognition. And then we move on to our instructional strategies. These can be a little tricky sometimes. So I'm going to choose select a value. Now the students were creating their own advanced organizer. Um, there were cues and questions happening from Mrs. Ellis. Uh, note taking, summarizing, um, and they were also identifying similarities and differences. But I truly believe that the strategy I'm going to choose for this first one was advanced organizers because they were depicting a picture of opposing views. Then I'm going to go ahead and go in and choose my second. And I think I'm going to choose, I was just going to say generating and testing, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do cues and questions because she was wrapping it up. Then I'm going to go to my web's depth of knowledge. And this is absolutely what we would call extended thinking. Grouping, whole group. Um, Mrs. Ellis wasn't using any teacher-directed technology, nor were the students, and that's okay. Uh, there definitely were a lot of indicators of learning. Um, so I'm going to go through, experimenting would definitely be hands-on. Student demonstrating would be more of them demonstrating a project, but I would say student graphic organizing, uh, teacher-directed question and answer. I would go over here student performing and presenting, probably a, a little bit of student discussion. They were talking when they were up at the board. 
um, student writing because we saw the student that I was speaking to his writing sample. Student interview, I would say that the student I interviewed partially articulated the learning. He couldn't give me the objective, but he definitely gave me the idea of what they were working on. Finally, we have the opportunity to send a note to the teacher. And I definitely would include something in the note that I love that her students were doing something outside of the box. They were learning about opposing views and defending their view. She had them coming up to the board. All of these things are so enjoyable to the students and they're having fun and they don't even realize how they're learning. So I would send a note to Mrs. Ellis and say all of those things to her. When I'm done, you're able just to save. And then I will go into Manage. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit this Sync button and that is going to officially upload the walkthrough that I just did. And then I'm going to go right next to her name. I'm going to choose this pull down. And I'm going to email it immediately to Mrs. Ellis. And that way she will have a copy to look at to see what I came up with when she gets a break during her teaching day. And that is the McCrell walkthrough from my point of view. Hi, Mrs. Ellis. Hi. I wanted to thank you for letting me come into your classroom to do a walkthrough this morning. I wanted to say the students were so engaged and it was such a great lesson. Thank so you. thank you. So I just wanted to go over the McCrell walkthrough with you so you can see that we're, what we're doing from our end of things. So, of course, I put chose grade mixed because I know you have a couple second graders mixed in with your third graders. And the subject was language arts. I believe I came in at the end of class. Yes. Which is kind of nice because a lot of times we don't get to see the end and how things play out. Um, I chose that you were providing feedback and giving the children effort and recognition as they were presenting their opposing views. And for your instructional strategies, I chose advanced organizers and cues and questions. Yeah. Uh, for web stuff of knowledge, I took it right to number four, extended thinking. So not only it was clear to me just in a little while I was visiting, that they not only had to think about what they were doing, they were able to present their opposing views. And I think that's an opportunity they don't get to do all the time. So I thought that was wonderful. For grouping, whole group. Um, no technology needed when you have such a great lesson. And there were definitely a lot of indicators of learning. The students doing the graphic organizing, you were questioning and answering, student discussion. I felt like they really were presenting their point of view as well as doing student writing. Mm -hmm. When we end the walkthrough, we do ask the student if they can state the objective, and the student I spoke to was right around it. He just didn't use the exact words, but I could tell he knew what was going on. So I just want to say that was such an amazing lesson, and you're doing such a great job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions for me? I don't think so. Okay. Thank you for coming in. And just so you know, I did email you a copy of the walkthrough, so when you have time later, feel free to look through it. And if anything pops into your mind, let me know. I will. Thank you so much. Thank you. I can't believe how much easier it was to do our power walkthroughs this school year, knowing that we could count on our principal and secretary to let us know when subs were available in the building. It made such a difference knowing that I still had my prep time, but I could still be involved in a big project like this. So I feel like that was such a plus this school year. Yeah, and I really liked how our principal was able to um, let us use some of the time in our staff meetings to talk about what we were seeing and kind of show our data to the students, or to the staff, to see what the students are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really liked when we t looked at our graphs and we showed them, you know, at the beginning of the year, we were doing a lot of the red zone, we were doing a lot of setting objectives, and then, you know, we got to show them how we were able to improve, and, you know, at the end of the year, if we look back at our Bloom's Web um, graphs, we can see, oh, we've done a lot more developing understanding, and... Yeah, yeah we'll look at... Um, our graphs from this year, see where we need to pick up next year, I think probably focusing in more on the blue zone right away um, when we come back will keep us in that blue zone and then take us a little bit further. Yeah, I think it was really helpful how the school improvement plan, like this really helped with that too because we actually had data to show this is what we're doing in our school, here's where we are, here's where the students are, here's where we need to go going forward. So that was really helpful this year too.
And our whole staff was on board. People were interested. They wanted those emails sent to them right after we did a walkthrough. Right. We were able to have conversations. And through the training we've had, help guide our teachers to getting to that next level of learning for our students. Because as we saw in the M step, that's where we need to go. These are the questions the state is going to be asking our kids at the end of the school year. So overall, I feel like we accomplished a lot this year with our walkthroughs. I, I do too. I agree. I know one of the big concerns that many schools and staffs have is when do you fit in all of these power walkthroughs? And I do think it takes a village to figure out how to make that work. When we first started, we were using mostly our prep time, lunch time, sneaking in, fitting them in whenever we could. But I think each school is different, but if everybody is on board, starting from your principal and your secretary on down, there are ways to fit in these walkthroughs. The use of subs is huge in that arena. Yeah, I think that was really great that we had teachers in the building write in their sub plans, like on Tuesday, if you have a prep, go to Mrs. Ellis's room, and that kind of stuff, because it really helped us use other subs that don't need to be in the classrooms during prep time. Right. right. Whenever we had a floating sub and they didn't have anywhere to be at a particular time, they were sent from the office to our rooms to cover so we could fit them in too. Mm -hmm. yep. And that gave us, instead of going only on our prep time, you could only see certain teachers teaching the same thing because their schedules don't vary from day to day. Mm -hmm. It gave us the opportunity to be able to see almost all the teachers in the building as often as we wanted and they were teaching all different subjects. 